What's the main message that ACA is sending to the assisted living facilities and the nursing homes in Tampa Bay and, and across the state? So we are focused on making sure that they are screening their visitors, their employees, and their staff. That we need to have laser beam focus on making sure that if anyone is sick, they're not visiting a nursing home. If they have traveled internationally, but certainly to the high risk countries, that they're not visiting a nursing home or assisted living facility. If they've been on a cruise ship internationally, again, we need to be very diligent in making sure that we are preventing this virus from coming into our nursing homes and our assisted living facilities because our elderly are at such great risk. Is there a standard bare minimum that nursing homes and assisted living facilities are supposed to be doing to protect them across the board so that it's a standard that everyone should be doing? Well, first and foremost, it's really important to stress that infection prevention and control is foundational to hospitals, nursing homes, and assisted living facilities. It's what they train their staff on. It's what they conduct drills on. Some are better than others. What we support through my agency is making sure that we are holding them accountable to adherence to those protocols, to those guidelines around infection prevention and control. We know what is fundamental from hand hygiene to thorough cleaning within the facility. That is basic infection prevention and control. What we are saying today is that they need to be at a much higher standard to restrict those who are coming into their facilities. So there should be a sign uh, at every facility. I went to facilities yesterday. I had my temperature taken. I was screened. I was asked all the questions. I had to fill out a log. No one is exempt from answering those questions. If a facility does not have that questionnaire in place, does not have that sign posted, are they breaking protocol? So right now, absolutely. Th this is what we are focused on. This is the guidance and requirements coming from the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, which oversees uh, hospitals and nursing homes. Now, I am also deploying my staff, and we are going on site to nursing homes and, and assisted living and hospitals to evaluate their adherence, but to support them. Right. At this point, we know that everyone is trying to do uh, what is in the best interest of protecting their residents, their patients, and so we will be there to evaluate and to provide technical assistance to support their adherence to those infection prevention protocols. Support is important because we want to make sure that people are doing what they can to protect the vulnerable populations that are in these facilities. However, are there is there teeth behind it? Well, there is teeth behind it. If we find uh, violations that are systemic, that put their residents at great risk, we will obviously take the actions that we can as a regulatory agency. But I think it's also important to uh, stress that the guidance is changing daily because of the new information that is coming out around the coronavirus. So we do need to be a resource to facilities that they've got the latest guidance, that they understand what is expected of them today, given how quickly this is changing. What happens if there is an outbreak like we saw in Kirkland, Washington? So again, our focus because of that tragedy is to make sure that we have the highest level of restrictions so, so that individuals, happen. they're not coming into those facilities. And then we need to make sure that regionally, hospitals and nursing homes and assisted living facilities, we prepare, we prepare for emergencies locally. That same degree of preparedness and local coordination needs to be occurring today so that there are conversations around how best to support. If someone ha meets the criteria and is being tested, how, do those, uh, how does that coordination occur locally? What happens if we do see it spread in a nursing home? What we know is that if someone ha has, uh, is being tested uh, or is presumptive positive, there are precautions that need to occur today in terms of isolation and the use of personal protective equipment. We need to have realistic assessments today about whether or not a nursing home or an assisted living facility can meet those expectations. That is not necessarily what they are today 
prepared to do? Because the bar right now is set very high by the federal CDC. That's why those conversations need to occur locally to make sure that if someone fits the criteria and there's a need to transfer, that that happens rapidly. If there were a resident in an assisted living facility who is ill with COVID-19, that person would likely be transferred versus? Th that person would likely be transferred, particularly because of their uh, compromised medical, their, their vulnerability to begin with. What I am also saying is, if the facility does not have the capacity to isolate, if they don't have the N95 masks, which nursing homes routinely would not necessarily have, and then more importantly, if they haven't trained on the use of those N95 masks, we need to have honest conversations locally about a transfer that needs to occur. Again, this is all about containment and taking care of that individual and protecting everyone else from the spread. And that's the concern because these are already susceptible individuals. Transferring them, moving them from a facility, even during a hurricane, can be very traumatic and it can cause, it can worsen health problems that maybe already exist. So that would be the last thing that you would want to do. Well, we have to look at the rapid spread of this virus and need to understand what true containment looks like. And so we will have to uh, certainly evaluate how best to accomplish that transfer if the facility can't meet those requirements around isolation and the use of personal protective equipment. Now that may be that there's a wing that can be dedicated, that there is another facility that is prepared to accept. Uh, but that really has to be a, a strong focus. Can we achieve these objectives around containment? Have you identified the facilities that may not be able to contain the virus? There are older nursing homes uh, or assisted living facilities that don't have the um, structure, the negative pressure rooms. They're not set up for that. And, and it's just, it's important to understand the CDC has set a much higher uh, standard for the isolation and the use of personal protective equipment. Nursing homes know how to deal with the flu. They have strong infection prevention and control in place. This is at a different level in terms of the isolation expectations, the negative pressure rooms, and the uh, personal protective equipment, the N95 masks. We just need to have a, a true assessment of who is able to meet those uh, requirements and what facilities will need to transfer. How are you able to identify and know, okay, we know that someone's being tested right here. We know that this facility has been honest and said that they cannot support isolation, or we've identified that they can't support isolation. We need to take action. So we are working very closely with the associations I have I uh, had multiple conference calls with the Florida Healthcare Association that represents the nursing homes, assisted living facilities, with other uh, associations that represent the assisted living associations, and with the Florida Hospital Association to have these very uh, conversations, to talk about protocols around transfer, to develop standardized forms so that there's comprehensive communication and information being shared. We're doing that daily. We have seen um, the individuals who have tested positive, a majority of them are 60 years and older. Have any, has anyone in an assisted living facility, a nursing home, been tested for COVID-19? To my knowledge, they have not been tested. And for the cases today that are positive, there has either been uh, travel involved or they have been exposed to someone who has traveled. When it comes to spring break, which is just next week for many of the uh, districts, school districts in the state of Florida, and of course, uh, as we start to move into April, many of our friends in the north are also going to have these spring breaks. This is a time when people want to come down and maybe visit family members, grandmothers, grandfathers who are in these facilities. What are we going to do to make sure that they're not bringing something? If they've traveled, they cannot. I know uh, the, the emotional uh, nature of this, that individuals want to be able to visit their loved ones, but for the sake 
of their loved ones if they have traveled, if they have taken any risk that fits the criteria, they can't visit. The VA has taken an extra step. Yes, they have. Do you like what the VA has done by saying we are not allowing visitors at all? We certainly are exploring where we need to evaluate. I, but our standard today is fairly comprehensive, but we understand that that may still uh, lead to some questions. We think it's fairly solid in terms of have you traveled internationally? Are you sick? Uh, some uh, facilities taking temperatures. But we will certainly evaluate whether we need to uh, make that more comprehensive. Many have said we need to be more aggressive in our approach, that it would be a, a very aggressive thing to really quarantine people who are well. Do you think that that would be the best way, though? We have to focus on what's going to protect our most vulnerable citizens and where they are susceptible. So uh, I toured facilities yesterday where organizations routinely might come into their nursing home. They are canceling uh, those types of activities. Assisted living facilities will evaluate whether or not to continue to do any kind of community engagement. We're not talking for, uh, hopefully, not a long period of time, but we need to take those aggressive actions now in order to prevent the spread and to be successful in our containment. Are tests available for nursing homes and assisted living facilities? Again, the testing is determined uh, locally with the County Department of Health. So they're evaluating the criteria, but it's also the process that has to occur to collect the specimen. So really that needs to be done in coordination with the County Health Department uh, and potentially the uh, hospital to support that testing. Is this something that we're going, it's not just for the next month or two months, this is something that we're going to potentially need to have in place? Well, I think that is what is so unusual. Florida has received high marks for its emergency preparedness when we think in terms of a hurricane. And that is what we now have to prepare ourselves for, that unlike a hurricane, where it is a, you ramp up uh, and then you are prepared and then you, you settle into to the response uh, to what may have occurred, this may be a much longer stretch uh, where we have to be hyper uh, sensitive to and vigilant around our efforts to contain. And again, we have laser beam focus on how we protect our elderly. But I want to stress, this is what nursing homes, assisted living facilities and hospitals, it's foundational, their infection prevention and control precautions, and we are working closely with them to make sure that they are adhering to those best practices. For individuals who may not be familiar with this, um, when it comes to a nursing home, an assisted living facility, a hospital that has had an issue when you all have gone in for inspections and they maybe haven't done so well in infection control, that's immediately fixed right then and there. It is immediately fixed and, and we look so closely at everything because it is foundational, infection prevention and control. We are looking to make sure that every aspect of their adherence uh, is evaluated and certainly fundamental to that is hand hygiene, cleaning the facility. So when we go in to inspect, we are looking comprehensively. So the least, uh, the smallest violation is identified to make sure that the uh, facility is comprehensive in their approach. And right now, those facilities that have previously received, had deficiencies, those are the facilities that you're double checking. So uh, first of all, I wanna uh, stress, we have been in over 275 nursing homes uh, over the last two weeks. We are focused per uh, additional direction from the federal government to identify any of the facilities that have had uh, violations that led to a higher level of risk. So we will be on site in those nursing homes to make sure that both we're supporting them and that they are adhering to those infection prevention requirements. And then this is a question uh, I was talking with a, a coworker of mine about, but it's true. With, with children, I have two young children, we talk about hand washing and the importance and how to wash your hands thoroughly. When it comes to some of these um, elderly individuals, are we talking to them about the best way to wash their hands? They may be in their 80s and they may have been washing their hands for 80 years, but reinforcing the best practice? It's such an important point, and we do. 
we expect when we talk about hand hygiene it isn't limited to those who visit or to the staff it, it pertains as well to our residents and so yes that is very much a part of the equation as well that we are supporting effective hand washing for our residents for our patients could you walk me through if I'm in a, a nursing home and I and I, and I let's say it was the flu for example because this is something that we've dealt with flu pneumonia if I'm in a nursing home am I do they call a doctor or is there doctors on staff? I'm, I'm unfamiliar. So, I'm so it's going to depend on the facility, okay. but certainly many um, residents may still have their local physician who will be contacted and will help to support uh, managing their, uh, their medical needs, including if they were to have the flu. And we would expect that if there are any concerns, respiratory illness for an individual in the nursing home, their first call is going to be either to the medical director, to the clinical staff, to their local physician to evaluate and then to the extent that there's uh, an unexplained respiratory illness or there's potential for exposure to someone who traveled, they're going to call the county health department and coordinate from there. Just to be clear, the individuals who have tested positive for COVID-19 and unfortunately the two individuals who have passed away from COVID-19, none of these individuals were in assisted living facilities or nursing homes. We do not have any cases today in a nursing home or assisted living facility. We are absolutely encouraging facilities to have effective and comprehensive communications with family members so they understand uh, all of the precautions that the facility is taking, that they are looking at alternative ways for family members to connect with their loved ones in a nursing home, in an assisted living, if they are unable to visit, all in the best interest of protecting their residents. Should they feel comfortable that their loved ones are safe? They need to have confidence in uh, the approach that nursing homes and assisted living facilities are taking. They should be asking questions of those facilities to make sure that they understand what the infection prevention uh, protocols are. Uh, we certainly make public information about facilities that have had any violations related to infection prevention and uh, uh, containment protocols. And as I said, we are deploying our staff. We will be aggressive in our physical on-site presence uh, with these facilities to make sure that they are